Good evening. Welcome to worship here at Shepherd of the Lakes Lutheran Church, where it is our joy, as always, to share our shepherd with you, no matter who you might be. So we welcome all of you in attendance. We welcome those who are streaming with us online this evening as we continue to, to meditate upon the, the passion history of our Lord as we walk with Him. And as we do, we, uh, on these midweek services, we, we see where His footsteps led Him, the, the people and places on the path to the cross, and, and to see what is going on there and what it means for, for us and our spiritual lives today. Uh, this evening, the thing that we consider is how His uh, final steps led to His enemies and why they needed to lead him there. We'll talk about that in our sermon for today. Our service is printed out for you in your worship folder and will be available for you on the screens as well. Uh, This evening we will begin with our opening hymn, Christ is our Cornerstone. Please stand. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of day. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with our psalm for this evening, Psalm 27.
we pray. Lord Jesus, you are the stone the builders rejected that has become the cornerstone. We praise you for facing the fury of your enemies undaunted. Because you overcame death itself, we will not die but live, and we will always proclaim your marvelous deeds. For you live and roll with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Continue now with the reading uh, with the third reading of the Passion History of our Lord. While Jesus was still speaking, suddenly Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with lanterns, torches, swords, and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Judas was leading them. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, the one betraying him, was standing with them. Then when Jesus told them, I am he, they backed away and fell to the ground. Then Jesus asked them again, who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they said. I told you I am he, Jesus replied. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the statement he had spoken, I lost none of those you gave me. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, whoever I kiss is the man, arrest him. Immediately he went to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Then they advanced, took hold of Jesus and arrested him. When those who were around him saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, so we strike with the sword? Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. But Jesus responded, Stop! No more of this. Put your sword back into its place, because all who take the sword will die by the sword. Do you not realize that I could call on my Father, and at once he would provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? But then how would the Scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Then he touched the servant's ear and healed him. At that same time, Jesus said to the crowd, Have you come out to arrest me with swords and clubs as if I were a robber? Day after day I was sitting in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has to happen, so that the writings of the prophets would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The company of soldiers, the commander, and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus and bound him. They first led him to Annas, because he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews, it is better that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple kept following Jesus. That disciple was known to the high priest, so he went into the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. But Peter stood outside by the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and talked to the girl watching the door and brought Peter in. The servants and officers were standing around a fire of coals they had made because it was cold. While they warmed themselves, Peter entered and sat down with the guards to see how it would turn out. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked directly at him and said, You were also with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I don't know what you are talking about. Woman, I do not know him. When Peter went out to the entryway, someone else saw him and said to those who were there, This is one of them. This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. After a little while, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, because even your accent gives you away. You are a Galilean. Then he began to curse and to swear, I don't know this man you are talking about. I do not know the man. At that very moment, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the Lord's word, how he he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside, broke down, and wept bitterly. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in a synagogue or at the temple where all the Jews gather. I said nothing in secret. 
Why question me? Ask those who heard what I told them. Look, they know what I said. When he said this, one of the official officers standing there struck Jesus in the face. Is that how you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus answered, testify about what was wrong. But if I said what is right, why did you hit me? The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They found none. Even though many witnesses, well, many false witnesses came forward, finally two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Yet even on this point, their testimony did not agree. The high priest stood up and said to him, Have you no answer? What is this that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I place you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you have said. But I tell you, soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? See, you have just heard that blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him. They covered his face, struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? The guards also took him and beat him, and they went on saying many other blasphemous things against him. Here concludes so far the passion history of our Lord. We continue now with our hymn, He Stood Before the Court.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The words for our meditation this evening are taken from Luke chapter 20. He, that is Jesus, went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. The word of our Lord. Here's a little something about myself that I'll tell you about uh, that you have no need to know, but since you have nowhere to go and since you're forced to listen, I'm going to tell you anyway. I get secondhand embarrassed very easily. You know what that is? It happens to me a lot, especially when I'm consuming media, watching TV, watching a movie, or or reading a book. If a character finds himself in an embarrassing situation, I get just as embarrassed. I feel embarrassed for that person. Um, It's been so bad before that I've I've wanted to close my ears. I've wanted to make an excuse to leave the room while that show or movie is going on. For some reason, it just bugs me when there's this awkward situation and the character, as they speak, is just making matters worse and worse with what they're saying. Part of me wants to to run away and just avoid what's going on. The other part of me wants to to step into uh, this fake world, this this make-believe world, and, and shake some sense into the person to get them to stop what they're doing. Maybe that last bit, maybe you can, uh, uh, empathize with a little bit, right? I want to, at times where we're we're watching something, we want to step in and just knock some sense into this person, this character that is just making the situation worse. Maybe sometimes we've thought about that as we've gone through Scripture. We wanted to step into the pages and knock some sense into someone who is just, you know, putting their foot in their mouth. Maybe sometimes you've had that thought even as you've heard Jesus' own words. Maybe You've had that thought as we looked at Jesus' words this evening. We look to see to whom Jesus is speaking. We see that Jesus is in front of the very people that want him arrested and killed. And here he is seemingly just saying the wrong things at the wrong time in the wrong way, just making things worse for himself. We want to step in. I want to get him to stop because we know where this is all going. We know what he is uh, uh, encouraging here. But Jesus needs to say these things. Jesus needed to be here. His final steps needed to lead him here to his enemies. This evening we see just why. This evening we see how his final steps led him to his enemies so that he could be a warning but then also so that he could be a cornerstone. Now, Jesus spoke this this parable, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He spoke this on Tuesday of Holy Week. Uh, On this day, Jesus has this this theological throwdown with the spiritual leaders uh, in Jerusalem. Jesus had rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, and everyone was, was shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he walked to the temple and he drove out all of the people that were were selling there in the temple. And then he sat there in the temple courts 
teaching the people, proclaiming the gospel to those who would listen. And then the Jewish leaders came. And they demanded of Jesus by what authority Jesus was doing all of this. They were looking for a way to bring a charge against Jesus to have him arrested and killed. They were obviously upset for the things that he was saying. Also upset probably that, they, they, he, they, um, that Jesus ruined their little their money exchange going on in the temple. And so they come to him and ask him this question. But Jesus, knowing what, what they want to do, responds with his own question. He asks them, by what authority John the Baptist carried out his ministry? And this trapped the Jewish leaders because they didn't believe in, in John the Baptist either, but they couldn't say that because the people really liked him. And they couldn't say that his, his ministry was from God because they knew Jesus was going to spring off of that. So they were stuck. So they simply said, we don't know. And because they refused to answer Jesus, Jesus also said, I'm going to not answer you with this question. Instead, however, he turns to the crowd now and speaks this parable, all the while addressing his enemies, those who had come to him. Now, Jesus, in this parable, he uses an illustration that the people would have been very familiar with. It's a very standard um, thing that they would have known, that uh, wealthy landowners would have had a vineyard in one part of the land, um, even though they may live in a different area. They would rent that land out to, to tenant farmers, what we would know as tenant farmers today. And it was their job to take care of the vineyard, to, to, to grow the vines, to take care of everything, and then uh, share the fruit of the vineyard with the owner then, to share the profit with the owner. And of course, you know, since it's mankind, there were obviously abuses on, on both sides. But here Jesus takes something that was very familiar and he kind of hyperbolizes it. He gives this very extreme situation. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Instead of sharing with what was rightfully the owners, these, these tenant farmers basically held this vineyard hostage for themselves. And they showed violence to anyone that would try to, to uproot this. And the violence is actually very, very surprising. Uh, three times... Uh, the owner sent servants to collect, and three times um, these tenant farmers mistreated, they beat up, they did shameful things to these servants, and then sent them on their miserable way back to their master. But what's even more surprising than the violence is the seeming, uh, is, is the, the patience and almost seeming ignorance on behalf of the owner. Who keeps sending people after you get that first servant back all beat up? But when the third servant finally comes back, what does he decide to do? Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. Maybe they'll treat him better when they recognize, okay, the owner is taking things seriously by sending his own son. We, we better back down. Not the case. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. If there was no heir to the one who owned the property, whoever was there owned it. So these tenant farmers said, well, if there is no more heir, then this is going to be ours by right since we occupy it and we're taking care of it. But this was their last mistake. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Their violence and rejection of the owner and those he sent ended in them being crushed by the owner. Now the people got what Jesus was saying. They understood the parable that Jesus was saying. Because when he finished saying, this is what the people said, they said, God forbid, or, or literally, let this not be the case, let this not happen. Because they got it. Because Jesus was 
using an illustration that was familiar in more ways than one. In Isaiah chapter 5, God compares the, the people of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, to a vineyard. A vineyard that he himself planted, that he tended to, that he cared for. And when it was time for him to check to see how the vineyard was doing, he found nothing but bad fruit. He found nothing good, only worthless. And so what does God do? God tears up the vineyard. He completely destroys it. He knocks down everything, digs up all the plants. As we see with the literal destruction and deportation of the people of Israel and Judah. But here Jesus kind of takes a, a slightly different approach to that illustration. Instead of looking at the vineyard proper, he points at the ones to whom we're supposed to be taking care of it. The ones that were left in charge of the vineyard. The spiritual leaders of the people. And instead of taking proper care of the vineyard, and instead of doing what was right, they reject it. They even abused and mistreated the servants that God would send to them. Think of the prophets that were sent time and time again to the people of Israel and Judah and how they were treated. You think about Elijah. You think about Jeremiah. You think about John the Baptist, the last prophet before Jesus came. They abused and mistreated those servants. They rejected the messengers from God. And now what were they doing? Now they were rejecting the Son. Now they were planning and plotting to kill him. Jesus' enemies knew exactly what Jesus was talking about too. They knew exactly the kind of warning that Jesus was offering. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Maybe that's the point where we want to jump in. That's the point where we want to, want to hop in and stop Jesus from speaking. Can you feel the tension? Can you feel the awkwardness in the air after Jesus utters this parable? You realize the offense that Jesus has given with his very, very blunt words. Why? Why was he doing this here? Doesn't he know the repercussions for what, his, what he's doing? Doesn't he know what's going to happen? That these people, from the time that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, they wanted Jesus dead. And he was giving them more fuel for the fire. But the thing was, yes, Jesus did know what was going on. And he needed to do this. He wanted his final footsteps to lead him to his enemies because he needed to issue this warning. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus was coming before his enemies with this warning. If they continue to reject, they will be the ones who will be crushed. They will be the ones rejected. They will be the ones who will be thrown out of that vineyard for eternity. And that's a hard truth. It's a hard thing to hear. It's a tough thing to say. It can be a truth to shy away from one that we might want to, to shy away from, something that we might be embarrassed by. We don't want to say something hard. We don't want to say something this, this tough. Especially when it can only just make a situation worse. Sometimes we, we have this temptation to just want to, want to tiptoe around things to, to have, or, or avoid it entirely. To be ashamed of this warning. But it's necessary. It, those words need to be heard by, enemy, by, by the enemies of Jesus. And we need to take this seriously because that's who we were too. We need to not take this message for granted because it was just as serious for us as well. 
that we were once enemies of Jesus. We were born into this world sinful, as Paul states, right? The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. When we were born into this world, we were those who rejected Jesus, those who were his enemies, those who were deserving of being crushed for all eternity. So Jesus lets his final steps uh, lead to his enemies so that he can issue this very serious, this very important warning to not be crushed. And yet though he does this, knowing full well what is going to happen to him, he does so confidently because of what is going to happen for him, it's going to happen to him, is going to be for the very sake of his enemies. Though he knew what was going to happen, though he knew he would be handed over, though he knew he would be forced to face suffering and death, though he would, ha- though he would, would be there on that cross, and we read some of that suffering tonight, didn't we? where he was spit on, where he was accused, he was accused of being a blasphemer, where he was struck while blind. He did all that willingly for the very ones that were doing all of this to him. And what the people asked for, God forbid that this this whole thing happen. It was actually planned by God himself. It was planned by God that his son would be rejected but in doing so would make his son to be a cornerstone, the cornerstone of salvation. Now back then a cornerstone was crucial to any kind of of architectural building. It was more than maybe what we think of a cornerstone today, that little box that we put with a year in the corner of a building. The cornerstone uh, in this time, in Jesus' time, was, was vital. It was the first stone that was set, and it was something that the entire rest of the foundation would be built around. It was the thing two of the walls would rest on and find complete support. So if that cornerstone didn't work, if that cornerstone wasn't laid correctly, or if it wasn't strong enough, the whole building would collapse. Everything would fail. Though Jesus would be rejected... God would establish him to be this cornerstone, this most important piece for salvation. And that's why his footsteps led him to his enemies. Because that salvation would be for them as well. He would be crushed on the cross in order to save those who wanted him crushed. He would be rejected by His heavenly Father so that those who rejected Him would have eternal life. That means that Jesus was led to His enemies for us. That means He was rejected for us. That means He was crushed for us. That we who by nature who rejected Him would have eternal life. There on the cross, He paid for all of our sins, all of our sins of weakness and fear and embarrassment. And with His work that completed, that Father would raise Him from the dead and set Him up as the cornerstone of our faith. Through faith, we are built and founded on Him. And because He is our cornerstone, we have no fear. No fear of falling apart, no fear of being crushed when we stand before the Father. On that last day, we stand firm because of him and the salvation that he achieved for us by being crushed, crushed there on the cross. And that also means we have no fear of being rejected ourselves, no fear of any enemies that Christ may have. For in doing this and allowing himself to be crushed by his enemies, he stood above them all, and he does now stand above all of them in all power and authority. All because his steps led him here to be a cornerstone. So there's no reason to be secondhand embarrassed by what is going on. No reason to feel like we need to jump into the situation because it's getting worse. Jesus' final steps needed to lead him here. He needed to be led to his enemies. For through this, through the ones that would arrest him, 
though they would be the ones who arrest him, those who would cause him suffering, bring about his death. He comes to warn them that in doing this, they would be the ones to be crushed. He is led to them so that through this very rejection, he would become a cornerstone, the cornerstone of salvation, the cornerstone of our salvation. Amen. You may remain seated. At this time, we will continue with giving our thank offerings to the Lord. Please stand for prayer. Gracious Lord, according to your will and promise, you send your Son into our world to atone for sin and restore eternal life. You planned his path to the cross. He confronted the blindness of unbelief, the confusion of doubt, and the hurt of death. was not deterred as he proclaimed your kingdom to the least, the last, and the lost. As we hear and contemplate the holy record of our Savior's passion and death, the sharp message of the law to empty us of pride and self-reliance. Humble us as we view the Savior in his humility remembering and believing that he endured the cross so we might be freed from its horror. In his suffering, show us our healing. In his grief, show us our joy. And in his death, show us our life. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the sake of Jesus. Amen. And we join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll close this evening with our hymn, O Perfect Life of Love.
Once again, good evening to all of you. Thank you for being with us on this night. And a, a big thank you to everyone who, who helped out and brought some food for our meal tonight. Uh, a great time um, for us to gather together um, before service. Um, I think we got everything cleaned up, so I'll, I'll thank you for that and all of your work, especially for uh, the person who's got to clean for service this Sunday. So uh, thanks for all of that. I don't have anything much for you. Remember, we've got uh, two more uh, Wednesday services, and then keep in mind, uh, Holy Week is coming up. That's the first week in April, so April 2nd will be Palm Sunday. That means that Thursday will be uh, Holy Thursday, and that Friday will be Good Friday. So those two days, Thursday and Friday, um, again, 6.30 time, same time as the midweek services, everything at 6.30. Uh, so keep that in mind as we get closer and closer to that day. Um, there are still plenty of uh, invites to our Easter weekend if you'd like to take some of those with you on your way out. Um, I can, we can also print off some more if we run out, so don't worry about that. We, we can uh, uh, always do more. Uh, so with that, I wish you the, the blessings on your night and the rest of your week, and may God be with you until we see each other again.